حالا حالا به حالا اون گوتن تاگ از برلین ایش بین دیوید بیکر این هی ایس ماین گنیدگه فراولین شامل این یانه پاون and that's actually my nice friend. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, David, for that very lovely introduction. So we're here in Egg Trims 2018 in Berlin. The president has swapped from David Miller to Bernard Hemmer. So um, welcome, Dave, um, Bernard Hemmer. And uh, we had an amazing set sessions in Egg Trims over the last two and a half days. So a lot of the topics which I'm going to discuss over the next hour has already been requested by our BART's MS blog readers, but we've also picked sessions of interest to us. So today we're going to present the highlights to you as they've come across to us. Yeah, and you've got to remember there's only two of us, so um, there are some things that um, we might not get to, but um, we are live. <laughs> and uh, so if you have any questions, please um, tweet us on uh, at Bart's MS blog. And for those of you watching on YouTube, why weren't you here when we were live? But um, please um, just put uh, your questions in the comments and obviously we'll try and respond to you when we see them. So on that, let's go. So there have been a couple of new faces in Ectrims, especially in the exhibition center. We've seen Selgin, Milan, and so new things are coming into the MS market, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, I think the big thing that has happened this year is we don't seem to have a blockbuster new phase three trial. So there isn't a drug just around the corner except all these new faces. And how can they get, um, you know, to have a drug that's ready for you um, because they're actually copies of oh. current drugs. So that's been a topic. So what can you tell yeah, us? Yeah, so for my, for my own interest, this is probably one of the most significant uh, programs I attended um, on Wednesday, which is about biosimilars. And uh, let's face it, they are in the pipeline and some of them are already being used in some of the countries. So um, until... Uh, last year I didn't understand what a biosimilar is and I'd need to explain to you through the steps so that you can appreciate in the clinic or um, if you're a patient when you see your clinician when you're going to be swapped to a biosimilar. Yeah because you so, might get new names for things that you already knew yeah. yeah. Um, so what in um, scientific fields we call a reference drug it is the brand product. So what the pharmaceutical industry has produced at the outset. Yeah, now, like um, Ale um, Lentrada and yes. you know, Ty Sabri and that's the type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, now a generic is a copy of this drug. Um, a biologic agent, on the other hand, is where the in active ingredients are from a biological source. Now, biosimilar is a copy of this biologic agent. Mm. I guess so, in simple terms, the one is like a chemical and the other one's like a protein. So mm -hmm. the protein has to be manufactured in a kind of different way and they're called the biologics. Now, the question begs, why are we in this situation to begin with? Now, if we look across the pond to the US, um, you find actually the US drug costs account for about half of their total cost of MS care, which is ridiculous really. And over the last year, um, the MS drug pricing has been uh, increasing substantially more than in any other therapeutic area in medicine in MS. So you can understand why insurers and uh, in our positions, why the NHS or what's called subsidized healthcare has actually decided to question whether people are willing to pay the prices of these drugs. Can I interrupt you? We've had a question. You said, um, which drugs do we get that are biosimilars? So in the UK, we know of one. Um, one is uh, um, uh, Bribio versus Capaxone, but actually uh, Capaxone isn't exactly a biosimilar. It's a, what's called a um, complex non-biologic drug. So, in fact, it needs to be tested as a, 
any compounds which are produced are alternative generic compounds, and it's tested that way. Um, but I'm sure that um, if we look at one of our old drugs, like rituximab, there's several biosimilars in the pipeline. But the ones which everyone is looking at currently are um, copies of interferon beta and natalizumab. So we're definitely going to be seeing prime time for those drugs. That should be interesting. So just for those of you not aware, so rituximab is a, a thing called uh, an, an antibody against a molecule called CD20. It's a B-cell depleter. And it's a bit like the other drug that's kind of one of the new drugs is uh, ocrelizumab. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the main things which you have to be aware about a biosimilar is that unlike the parent product, you don't have to demonstrate superiority of your compound. So it either has to be comparable in its efficacy or similar to the compound. So all of your studies are equivalent studies. And generally speaking, the licensing also is not as stringent depending on where you're from. In the EU, you need to demonstrate clinical trial data of efficacy, but not outside of the EU. So you need to be aware of this before you take on uh, um, biosimilars. But in MS, this is a new thing for us. Um, unlike other fields, like for example, if you take rheumatology, yeah. which has been using biosimilars for several years, this is a definitely a new thing for MS. So I'm interested to see how the next few years pan out yeah, because I think, you know, I guess we can see in the next few years, there's going to be lots and lots of new things, more choice, mm -hmm. more complicated landscape. And so yeah. it's important that we kind of know what they are mm -hmm. and uh, we kind of know how they work and how they're safe and how they differ. And that kind of is help you and, 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 and you to make the right choices. I am concerned, however, about um, the remits set for biosimilars. And in fact, um, your policy provider doesn't require your healthcare professional approval to switch you. And that I find uh, quite um, concerning, especially if we look at some of the previous bloopers, as I call of biosimilars. So the anti-epileptics are a very good example of this. So we've known for the last 20 years that carbamazepine versions and oxcarbamazepine versions weren't equivalent and there have been e increased in seizure frequencies and increase in the number of people being swapped back and forth between All drugs. Right. So um, as it's not an exact and it never will be an exact copy, this may be a potential problem in MS field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how I guess the companies will spend a lot of time trying to say my drug's better than your drug because um, you know, there is a subtle difference, so that's obviously... Well, we'll watch this space. Yeah. So what else do we have, David? Well, I guess, you know, there's all sorts of things that um, um, we're thinking about treatments, and one of the treatments we're obviously interested in is whether we can control um, progressive MS, and I mm. guess there's been a lot of concern about failures, and we've taken the drugs that are, you know, working in relapsing MS, and... Um, it's really only ocrelizumab which has shown that it can actually work in progressive MS as well. But some of the trials in the past have been seen to fail, and one of those trials was called ASCEND, and that was testing Tysabri or Natalizumab in secondary progressive MS. And because the outcome was uh, walking and there mm -hmm. wasn't a, an effect seen on um, the walking function, the trial was considered by... Um, uh, the community has been a failure. Yeah. And it's quite interesting that if we have started to look at different outcomes, um, hands, for example, it's, it looks actually like think there was... Think hand. Think hand. Um, there was a positive res uh, result. And it was very interesting that um, there's a study reported looking at a thing called neurofilament. And, and this is a, a component of the nerve and what happens is when the nerve gets damaged, the, the protein in the nerve gets released and it goes into the brain fluid and eventually into the blood and you can measure it. And if you have this protein in the blood, it's a marker of damage perhaps. Mm -hmm. And what was very clear and very interesting that in this trial considered to fail, that there was a very clear difference in that there was a lot less of this marker um, being detected, indicating 
that there was actually benefit and slowing of the nerve damage. Now the question is, is people say, well, that's because it's blocking the you know inflammation that's going on, and that's obviously quite probable. Uh, but there's a question about whether um, the effect is independent of relapsing attacks or not, and whether there are active lesions. And it was quite interesting that in people where they hadn't detected mm -hmm. these active lesions, there were still benefits seen, which would then suggest that some of the drugs that we're using mm -hmm. right now will be of benefit in slowing the nerve damage, and as a consequence, it will hopefully transpire that it will slow disability in the future. And I think there was one example where we were looking at the long-term impact of beta interferon, and mm -hmm. it was very quite clear that many years down the line, there was quite clear benefit in terms of slowing um, disability, which is again something that the community has said, oh, it doesn't work. But well, with time and looking in different ways, you can see things. So this neurofilament um, yeah. aspect has been, I think, one of the, the new things of this meeting. And I guess if you're a regular reader of the Bart's blog, you'll have heard of this quite a lot, because I guess my learned colleague has been championing this, but um, we've heard a lot of, of stuff this year. Yes, um, so neurofilaments um, was very topical. It's probably the most uh, second uh, in terms of the level of attendance and level of sessions attributed to it. Um, so was, there was uh, talks from Frederick Peel, Maria Pierre Somani, and also Jackie Palace. Now, um, Jackie interestingly said that our current methodology of measuring disease activity, which is MRI, doesn't in fact capture all of the disease. And when that happens, that's a problem. And also the long-term effects of drugs uh, in terms which are captured by the MRI are quite modest. So we don't, uh, MRI is not a good predictor of mm. long-term disability, long-term disease activity, and long term disease response. So this is where obviously neurofilament, which is a biologic measure of damage of axons, enters into the market. Now, um, Charlotte Tunison looked at about uh, meta-analysis, so like a massive comparison of more than 10,000 subjects um, to see how healthy controls um, untreated, relapsing, remitting MS patients and secondary progressive patients all differed in terms of neurofilament levels. And she said that there was an age-related rise in the healthy control of neurofilament proteins because as we age, we break down proteins, understandable. Um, but there is this overlap between all three um, disease components, including healthy controls between the age of 50 and 60. So I can foresee a limitation of this test coming in in older patients. There now, was a suggestion, I think, that this could be a, a, new, a new mark, and they called it, uh, um, for looking at acti disease activity, and they call it NIDA NFL. Yes. That's no evidence of disease activity. And NFL really isn't National Football League. It's like Euro football. You know, uh, yes. I know the Americans are getting excited about that. You know, um, so yeah, this was the work presented by Maria Pia, mm -hmm. where she showed that there was a substantial overlap between NEDA four, uh, which includes brain atrophy measures as well, and as well as the NEDA four neurofilament components. So the overlap was about sixty. 7%. So you may be able to interchange the biomarker into the NEDA component, right. which is very interesting. So this is something new to see. Can I interrupt you? And uh, we've got another question. It says, uh, where do I get my neurofilaments done and, and, and do I need a lumbar puncture? Well, there was some uh, data presented again, mm. um, looking at the correlation between what's in the blood and what's in the, br in the brain. And, uh, it was yes. pretty close in the data that, you know. So the correlations across the board are pretty close, but you have to understand that, um, and this was presented by Charlotte, um, that the difference between serum neurofilament and CSF neurofilament was 100 picograms per mil. Now, it also depends on the machines or the instruments used to measure this. And there is something called the SIMOA nowadays, and it's a, supposedly a lot more sensitive in the blood. So the future practice may be 
that blood neurofilaments may make it into the market. But I'm still hesitant to recommend this as the levels detected in the blood are quite low and there is fluctuations which occur. Now, um, I have to say that all the speakers who were also championing neurofilaments said equally the same thing and they did feel on balance that you can't give the MRI a boot. And uh, it's all about clinical skills, using the MRI, putting the neurofilament result in there and coming up with a bigger picture. So that's where we stand. And there are a number of labs around the world uh, that can do these assays. And mm. um, if you obviously need to get one, you can always get your neuro neurologist to either contact to us or, um, and we may be able to tell you uh, which labs can do it. So also there's um, a couple of labs in Europe as well who do it, and also I'm not sure about the states, but um, I'm sure they'll be coming up or in the states as mm -hmm. well. Oh, right. we've, got, we've got another question. I took beta interferon, and my neuro stopped stopped it when I got in a wheelchair. Should I have stayed on it? Well, um, mm -hmm. I guess the question is, is it's not a simple answer because the, the biological. Uh, answer and then there's a financial answer and I guess in the, the UK um, you know it's a different because mm. the government kind of regulates when people can be on it and they have stopping criteria but um, I think what was very clear from this meeting is that inflammation uh, which drives the the attacks is present from the very 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 beginning and it's there at the very end and one of the things we we knew that uh, there was a study, and, and we, we've heard of relapsing attacks. But one of the earliest features was a um, thing called clinically isolated syndrome, which is the first kind of clinical attack. But in some cases, you, people have a, a, an issue and they get a yeah. scan, and there's a thing called a radiological isolated uh, syndrome, which is essentially before you get multiple sclerosis. And because um, people really weren't knowing what was going on. Some people have had biopsies, and there were seven people who've had biopsies who've had this radiologically isolated syndrome. And surprise, surprise, what did they see in the, these things they saw? The typical MS lesion with demyelination, with evidence of re some repair, and with evidence of nerve loss. So MS obviously starts subclinically years or sometimes months before you know MS really shows itself but it shows us that there is demyelination and damage right from the very beginning so we need to deal with that and inflammation but now okay no, but I digress I, I mean uh, there, there was also other big pointers from that the two of the patients who converted were oligoclonal band positive so mm. we come back to biomarkers again. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lesions were quite large as well, so mm. maybe we're missing something in the pathology mm. which we see currently in MS. But I'll um, cut you off and we should go back to neurofilaments because there was you know, <laughs> quite a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah, no, the, um, I mean, going back to early diagnosis, uh, one of the things which um, in our um, debate session, burning debate was discussed, was the McDonald criteria. And if I plug the neurofilament again, in, um, in that it was shown that you can differentiate between the 2010, which is the old McDonald mm -hmm. criteria, and the current iteration, the 2017 iteration, which allows you to use treatment from the outset. It, neurofilament levels could differentiate between the what they call the new version of CIS, where the levels were low, and those who were MS, where the levels were high. Mm. So I found that very interesting. I think even in radiologically isolated syndrome, you can apply the neurofilament light mm. chain and start treatment earlier. And there was a suggestion, I think, um, if you have high levels of, mm -hmm. of that, it may reflect that your disease is under active control and it may be a marker that you're not going to do too well in the future. So it's actually going to, it could be a really good useful tool in the uh, neurologist toolkit, you think? Yes, um, and then that brings us nicely on to this topic, should all MS be treated? 
which was one of the first talks I attended on Wednesday, and it was talking about benign MS, in fact. Um, everyone worries about benign MS because they think that there is a fair proportion of patients who may go on to have a disease cause much um, later in the in the illness which may relapse or do badly. And in fact, um, I don't think the problem is we don't know what benign MS is. Mm. So if we don't know what it is, the definitions are quite variable. So some suggest an EDSS score less than four over a 10 year period, whilst others suggest an EDSS score less than three. Now, what are these EDSS scores? They're disability levels, and it essentially uh, means that people are fully ambulatory for that 10 year period. Now, this is a retrospective diagnosis. And if you have to wait 10 years to know whether you're going to be benign or whether you're going to be in a wheelchair, I think that's unfair. And, uh, which, and we know from our analysis data that if you treat early, you have a better outcome. So the beta interferon study showed that we have a 21 year analysis on that. So if you've got a great outcome, why would you not treat patients early and all patients, um, particularly when some of these relapses, which happened, 50% of them in one study was highly disabling. Mm. If that was me, I don't know. I mean, yeah. uh, so, I would so, decide. So um, we had another uh, tweet, and it said, um, um, I think I've got MS. And um, would these criteria change um, my, you know, Neuro's opinion? And I, I, I'll let you answer it, but I think what was clear in the debate, um, Professor um, Alan Thompson was there, and what he was really getting at was that um, it was to get to the case where you have these clinically isolated syndromes, which you really think are MS. Um, it allows you to make that diagnosis with um, mm -hmm. um, more confidence, and it, he, what he was suggesting is that it's in the tricky cases. You know, you should be obviously have a caution, but it's where you know everything looks like MS. So as they said, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck. Yes, um, I like that. I think there was a rubber ducky in yeah. the picture as well. Yeah. Um, so we've got another question, which is: Would you treat a patient who is seventy years old? Well. Um, I'll answer that one. Mm. <laughs> and the problem you have to realize is that all of our clinical trials have an age cutoff. So we don't know what the effects of these drugs in patients about the age of 55. Um, obviously, you can, there are in practice people who are much older being prescribed these drugs. But I don't think we even know what the disease is mm. like at the age of 70, do we, David? I mean, well, I think, I think the, there was obviously evidence from uh, the data that was printed, presented in a number of cases that the younger you are, the, probably the, the better you can respond to the, the treatments. But, um, you know, as I said, we know disease is active from the beginning to the end. Um, and I guess the worry for me was like, it was, you know, if you're thinking about MRI imaging, is that they're saying, well, if you're over 50, you know, you have all sorts of things going on in your brain. Mm -hmm. So, again, when we're thinking about these new criteria, we've got to be careful um, yeah. um, who we're actually applying to. Because if you're older, you're more likely to have these white spots in there. What, what does it mean? You know, that's part of age. And, and again, we're losing nerves as we're talking to you right now. So. I mean, the commonest mimic um, is um, vascular disease as you get older. And if I don't think we have a good way of picking mm. out whose increased lesion load is vascular lesions as opposed to MS lesions. Mm. Um, obviously, um, I think the McDonald criteria will continue to change, mm. and there's a technique, MRI technique, called central vein analysis, where mm. you look at in perivascular venous spots mm. in the MS lesions, and that are, those are meant to be more sensitive on differentiating the two. Mm. So um, I don't think the McDonald criteria is quite done yet. In the next couple of years, you will have yeah. several iterations. Yeah, I think you know, there was a, a, a number of posters talking about the central vein um, as a way of trying to get a bit more specificity in, this, in the thing. And um, obviously, keep going with the questions. So it's really good mm. that you're watching. Um, yeah. You know, carry on. Um, and obviously, not something which wasn't covered in Ectrims this year, which was 
ocrelizumab in uh, primary progressive patients. Mm. We have to just wait and see. It's approved um, everywhere except the UK, mm, yeah. but let's see where we go with that. Mm. Um, so moving on. Um, well, there was a few things, and I mean, I guess one of the things we won't dwell on too much, it was like there was the long-term seven-year data of, of alimentizumab. Mm. So, oh, sorry. Um, eight year, eight, eight year, yeah. David, eight. <laughs> oh, uh, we're out, I mean, we're moving on. Yeah. Um, so each year adds to the alimentizumab yeah. data, yeah. and it seems like the effect on disability progression is sustained, mm. and so is its um, protective effect on brain volume loss. Mm. So yeah. I think um, induction therapies work pretty well, yeah. uh, which brings me on nicely to some of the work which has been presented today and um, over yesterday about switching. So um, switching uh, from fingolimod through to alemtuzumab, there was a study which looked at that and the mean switch time, so quickly switching um, from one to the other, was about seven weeks and they found that there was a relapse rate reduction, not not any rebounds or anything mm. like that. And the lymphocyte count, which we worry about when we switch these patients, wasn't a concern. So they switched um, people from zero lymphocytes up to one lymphocytes. I think the range was quite substantial. Mm. And there was no concerns over it. And the efficacy wasn't corroborated mm. by the lymphocyte count at the outset. So mm. the, the drug is obviously doing something over and above it. Mm. Then the other was um, switching those who are highly active from natalizumab through to alemtuzumab, which was also done, mm. and um, which didn't have an issue as well. So very good in achieving relapse rate reduction when mm. you switched from natalizumab. Yeah, I think, I think there'd been a concern um, that um, fingolimod was stopping um, alemtuzumab from working when there was a switch. And there was, I would say, a number of uh, studies reported mm. that on the whole that there wasn't evidence to really support that it wasn't stopping yeah. alemtuzumab working. And, and so that's kind of good news to... Um, to I mean, to uh, and there was also further data reported on natalizumab, um, extended dosing of the natalizumab. So instead of giving oh. once a month, yeah. extend it and see what happens. Yeah. So this was kind of generated from, obviously, we know the big problem with um, mm -hmm. Tysabri or natalizumab is that PML can occur. So this is that disease caused by a, a brain virus um, called JC virus. And, you know, there is a risk and, a, you know, it, it's quite substantial. But mm -hmm. the companies have tried to de-risk it by stratifying how, how you dose and how you switch from it. But there's a suggestion that... Um, Mm -hmm. that uh, if you extend the dose from once every four, four weeks to something like once every six weeks, that um, you can avoid some of the issues of, of PML. Now, they showed um, that in their initial studies that there were no cases of PML, but we know that isn't necessarily yeah, so the case. so there was four in the placebo, mm. um, yeah. not in the placebo, the old version of uh, natalizumab mm. dosing once a month, mm. and zero in the extended yeah. dosing. Now... I think um, this is all exploratory. Mm. Obviously, we need more data. Mm. We need a few more mm. years of data to yeah. see how it performs. But it's nice to know that if you extend, yeah. um, you don't have to give these dosing as frequently yeah. as we're giving it. So it doesn't compromise the efficacy yeah. of the drug. So there was a post to, to saying that. Mm. And I guess what we're saying is obviously don't um, extend the thing until the manufacturers change the label. Oh, yeah. yes. You know, it's important <laughs> that the manufacturers tell us how we should do it, not, mm. you know, uh, uh, so it's evidence-based. That's what we want to say is, you know, the studies are ongoing, but it's, it's interesting that it may be possible to de-risk. It doesn't get rid of the risk, but if, obviously, the extended dosing doesn't compromise efficacy but reduces the risk of PML developing that, I think that's a great one, you know? Um, so there are two questions. Um, one from the blog is, is there a drug for secondary progressive MS? Well, that's a good one. Well, I mean, the, we know there is uh, something on, 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 the, on the horizon, horizon mm -hmm. and, and that's one of those is called a cyponimod, I think, isn't it? Um, yes, and uh, they've just filed, so let's see what comes out of that. So cyponimod <laughs> is, is like 
the brother or sister of uh, the other drug called Fingolimod, Fingolimod which didn't do too well. No. And <laughs> um, we also have to say, you know, at this meeting there are other um, what, uh, drugs, uh, Xanamod, I think, is another one, and Pasanamod is another one. So we're going to have lots and lots of mods, you know, um, arriving. Well, let's not forget that the late breaking is happening this afternoon and the MS Smart trial data. So for all of those who participated, this is the PI of the study was Jeremy Chataway, and um, we will see what mm. the outcome is. Mm. So even though I participated a bit on this, I have no clue what the outcome mm. of that trial mm. is. So I'm hoping that we have some new drugs mm. which um, would be helpful in uh, secondary yeah. progressive. But it, again, that's only a phase, what we call a phase two. So there is some way to go. Um, but you know, there are studies ongoing. We've well, got the MS um, STAT trial, which is And Ibudolast has already shown yep. a positive outcome. Yep. So there's lots of things mm. which can be moved on. So Ibudolast, for those of you, uh, that was kind of reported uh, again a little bit this year. And um, it's a, a kind of a molecule that uh, was originally going to be used in MS SMART, but it, because the Americans had done MS SPRINT, uh, they use mm. fluoxetine and uh, riliazole and another one called amylaride. So we'll see if any of those are horses that can cross the finish line or obviously they fall at the hurdle. We'll, we'll find out you know, in a few hours. And if you're on the blog, we'll have it as, as it arrives within a few minutes. So um, mm -hmm. you know, it will, will, will come live. And so we look forward to see what happens yes. there. Um, just a point to the audience yeah. that um, although the MS that study, the initial one was positive and then there is a secondary one, it does use high dose simvastatin. Yeah. So there are obvious risks of side effects to be uh, thought about. Yeah. So speak to your clinician or your um, primary physician before you start taking these tablets yourself. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I mean I've, I've gone to a bit of news from Abudalast and um, the question is, is how does our Budalast work if it's working? Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the answer is we don't know. But there was one uh, study here which yeah. was really kind of interesting. And it was that it may influence synapses. Now, synapses are the nerve connections. And it was suggested that um, actually it may modify synapses. So every day we make new synapses as we learn things. And we mm. kind of, during the night, we kind of get rid of them and, and, and model, but that's obviously what makes our brains work. And what was also very elegantly shown is one of the problems, yeah. one of the early problems of MS is not necessarily the nerves being lost, it's actually the synapses uh, are being stripped. Mm -hmm. and, and that could be actually a, a fundamental pathology in multiple sclerosis, it's just these tiny connections are being kind of damaged. Mm -hmm. And if, so again, if we have drugs that can stop that it's actually quite interesting and so mm -hmm. you know it may be by luck we've actually come across a drug that may have that capacity um, and so we'll have to wait and see what happens when I guess mm -hmm. the phase three trials. Um, okay we have another question which is are there treatments for remyelination? Mm -hmm. Well yes the best one is get rid of inflammation and then let the body repair itself. Yeah. Oh. But there are others, right? Yeah, of course there are. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a few, few more, and there's, um, you know, you've heard of anti-lingo. Um, well, th there's another uh, antibody that can kind of do a similar thing that was being kind of reported in, in what we call phase one trial. Um, too early to say if it will work or not. What and was this? I can't, it was on the map. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I can't remember again with an E. <laughs> um, and, and obviously there are you know different sort of treatments um, that may be useful and it was really really interesting um, you know we think about oligodendrocytes these are cells that myelinate um, mm -hmm. the, the, the nerve and you kind of think of oh there's these immature ones and there's mature ones and there was some really interesting um, work that came from Edinburgh by a, a guy called French constant yeah. and um, uh, what they showed is they looked at the individual um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, oligodendrocytes and actually they could see lots of different types. So um, it's actually going to be a, a lot more complicated perhaps than we thought. 
Um, and then the question is, is which ones are good repairs and non-good repairs? <laughs> but obviously, once we know that there are more than one type and we can actually learn what they do, then it also allows us to learn how we actually stimulate the individual ones. So that's probably going to be a watch of space over the you know, coming year or years as, as that uh, research evolves because... Um, you know, we are in our infancy in, in, in mm -hmm. that. Um, um, what are the biotin crew doing at the moment? Because that was quite topical in last year's Ectrims. Where are we with yeah, them now? Yeah, well, I, I guess there was some, some data presented about the, the real kind of life. I mean, there's a mm. lot of people in uh, France that are taking this agent. And Kudos for the French government for providing these treatments for free. <laughs> mm. That's something else. But anyway, the... Well, I guess, you know, there was some evidence that it's, it's actually pr providing some benefit. I still think the question is, is what is it doing? Is it symptomatic or, or is it really fundamentally mm -hmm. affecting the uh, progression? I'm, I'm open on either, either side, I think. Um, I guess we have to really wait to see until the proper trials, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, report, and then we'll actually... Uh, can say more. Okay. Well, uh, you know, one of the other questions which we had is, um, are there any studies on cannabis oil? Oh, uh, well, there were certainly studies on cannabis, and that's, you know, the medical version. And mm. again, you know, it is a licensed drug, and what they've been looking at is the real-life use of that drug. And I guess it I didn't see anything in Ectrims or on this specific label, so. Yes, there was. Oh, yeah. oh okay. You weren't in that session, but I was. <laughs> and essentially, what it kind of reinforced the view is that there is some activity in them, spasticity, which is, you know, good for them. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. So um, we'll be seeing more of that, hopefully. Was this a phase two? No, no, this is, this is a post marketing study, so. Oh, okay, you know, it's, all right, um, wonderful. Mm. So um, we'll, we'll hear more from them. Hopefully that paper will be published mm. and we'll post on it on our yeah. blog. Yeah. Can I buy CBD oil and does it have THC? Uh, well, <laughs> you can, but I'm not going to recommend that you buy it. And um, so, again, we ask, um, where is the evidence? Um, mm. I do know that CBD uh, oil has kind of been approved for certain types of epilepsy. Um, but in terms of multiple sclerosis, yes. um, there is no hard evidence. We've done a lot of work um, in the animal models, and I can say for some things there may be some use, and for other things, I don't think the evidence is, is there. So, I, again, I would, wouldn't recommend it because you know I, there isn't the evidence base uh, mm -hmm. to say it's of value. So, if you want to try it, that's kind of I'm not going to say. Yeah, yes no, I mean, uh, um, from a medical perspective, I think I would want definitive evidence that something is helpful mm. and it does need to be, to be legally mm. prescribable, it needs to be licensed. Mm. So um, please check before you randomly start mm. ordering things off the internet. Mm. But it's good in shampoo, isn't it? I'm joking. Caffeine. <laughs> okay. Right, so what, okay, let's move on to the other ducks in the lineup. So, Herb was. Herb, the... well, Herb. Um, so, I guess for those of you uh, who are aware about the potential of a virus being a trigger mm. of multiple sclerosis, um, there were um, data presented of a phase two trial of an antibody against these human endogenous retroviruses. And um, I'm sad to say the primary endpoint wasn't met. So um, mm -hmm. disappointing. that's disappointing. They did claim that there could be some secondary benefits in some yeah. of the um, other outcome measurements, the MRI mm -hmm. outcome measurements. But essentially, if the trial would fail, that would mean that you would have to do another trial. Um, but it did suggest, of course, that it wasn't driving the kind of attacks. Yeah. And therefore, it suggested that some of the ideas were potentially either wrong or, or that they weren't adequately targeted because it was asked if, if actually, you know, how does this um, drug work? And it was suggested that, um, that it was working in the brain and it was 
well said it was question whether you know mm. for the antibody actually would ever arrive there. And yes. I you know I'd have to agree. You know, if we looked at the antilingo, it was like ninety nine point nine nine percent excluded from the brain. So not a lot got there. And, there, and in the Biogen trials, we're using 100 milligrams. And in the, these trials, we're using like 20, five times less. Mm -hmm. So not a lot would get in. So maybe there's you know, still the idea is not dead. It might yeah. be that we just have to approach it in a different way. So um, not yeah. good, good news, but that's you know, what science is. You, know, you, you put a hypothesis. And sometimes the hypothesis is rejected, and then you just. Well, the study is not adequately designed. No, that's no, the no. other problem. <laughs> These um, uh, novel um, trial drugs are often mm. underpowered, and you end up rejecting a plausible drug mechanism mm -hmm. just simply because you're not recruiting enough patients. Yeah. Um, so we need to be careful of yeah. that. When we say a negative trial, you need to critically analyze what has been actually put in because it's rubbish out, yeah. rubbish in, rubbish mm. out. I mean, that's what you get. So um, look at the data people before you say and discard a drug. Well, um, we've, had another, we've, had another, we've had another thing from one of our uh, leaders. What happened to the Cambex trial now? Obviously. We weren't. What, where, what, there was nothing in terms about Cambex, was there? Yes, there was. <laughs> okay. Today. And uh, so this was a trial on an, a new antispastic drug. And I have to say, mm -hmm. sadly, um, the trial failed. You know, it didn't yeah. work uh, or didn't seem to work uh, in, in the trials. Uh, there might have been a, a glimmer, but, you know, that's kind of potentially making things uh, up. Um, you know, at the end of the day, trial failed. But having <laughs> said that, there was also um, more good news for another company uh, who made a drug, I think, called Flex, something or other, and that seemed to actually have an impact on spasticity. Again, a phase two trial. Okay. So there may be bad news for me and good news for other people. Um, so, David, I mean, uh, the Cambeg study was your study, wasn't it? Yes. Are so you... I mean, that's bad, right? Well, it is for me. <laughs> you know, but you know, we, we tried our best. And at the end of the day, the trial was designed to uh, show an effect. And we didn't see the effect we wanted to, to see. And we have to either give up or we have to move on. And that's that's mm -hmm. the hard life of, 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 of drug development. You, know, you, you, you win some, but you lose a lot. So, mm. Mm. Oh, well. Oh, well. Right. Life goes on. Yeah. Um, Thanks for that one. Uh, <laughs> so we, we look at um, how there was, and the other theme was um, real life data. Mm. And how would you critically evaluate real life analysis? And um, there is this concept of pragmatic trials approach versus randomized controlled trials. Mm. So a bit like uh, what's been done in other fields, like the stampede study, you may have people who are failing X treatment, and you come up with two other options, which yourself or the, phys or, or the person looking after the patient and the patient themselves decide which drug they want to go mm. on to. And these are just prospective observational studies. And I think we just need to come up with good ways of statistically analyzing mm. all possibilities because real life data is what happens in real life people. And if you can't do that type of analysis or do it robustly, then we don't know what happens in real life. But I think there was some, a good example uh, here yeah. where, where basically the French um, looked at their um, patients to say, I'm on uh, terifunamide and I'm on dimethylfumarate, which one's better in real life? And mm. what the, the uh, French people said is that if we looked at the uh, relapsing attack, um, there was no difference. If we looked at the progression, there was no difference. If we looked at the MRI, maybe the DNMF was a bit better. But then, uh, then there was another a Danish study, and actually, say, well, they said, well, DMF was better than um, terifunamide in the attack. So, it tells us, you know, without actually being able to do proper yeah. randomized trials, um, you can't really get the. You can't judge answer, efficacy. An idea. I, I'm. You're right in saying you can't judge 
efficacy, but mm. days are gone where you have effective treatments, mm. you can't do placebo control mm. studies. Yeah. And randomized control trials have huge sample numbers in them to show an efficacy endpoint. Um, whereas in um, observational studies, you don't have uh, thousands of patients in your, in your practice. So I think what we're going to be looking at in the future is lots of collaborative efforts between clinicians where start, patients will be recruited into various arms. So mm. um, this is probably a new age in, trial, mm. um, in trials which are being done. Mm -hmm. So obviously you, you asked me the, the question that actually made me quite sad about you know, the trial. Actually, we've got another question. It says, you are uh, always talking about B cells. Do I have too many B cells and can I have my B cells measured? <laughs> well, actually it makes me quite happy actually because many of the uh, presentations mm -hmm. that uh, were there this time were actually talking about B cells. And, and it was good to see that in many cases Mm. What we've been saying about the B cell subtypes perhaps being important in MS were yeah. confirmed. And in fact, uh, terifluramide was a good example uh, where if we believe you know, the efficacy data that it's not as potent as some of the other agents, then we would predict that it wouldn't be as good at depleting these B cells mm -hmm. as the potent agent. And in fact, that's exactly what has been shown. So, at least I can um, smile about something. I mean, <laughs> from a practical perspective yeah. about teraflunamide, I came across an interesting poster. Mm. So all of us worry about the transaminitis or this dramatic increase in liver function tests. And um, what we found, uh, well, what this data showed was that interestingly, um, they kept the patients between who only had greater than three times or five times the upper limit of normal of the liver function on teraflunamide, and they found that these rises in liver function were transitory, which is interesting because I panic and I take people off. So they had about 3% of their cohort, which was um, um, upper limit was about five times the upper limit of normal, and they took them off, justifiable, mm -hmm. but the others, they kept them on, and they found that it went down to normal levels. So what the, what's going on there? I mean, the author had no explanation. It's just that they had continued it during the course and found um, that we, we worry too much about liver function mm -hmm. tests, I believe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the other ducky in the pond was HSCT. Hemopoietic stem cell. Yeah, so the um, Sheffield group were presenting, and in fact, they had a multi center study um, which, um, where they had 20 patients from five different centers spread across um, the world, and they were looking at NEDA on HSCT in this no patient group. So, and the whole idea was using HSCT as first line. Um, why would you, I mean, this is about early treatment again mm -hmm. with a highly potent drug. And uh, the characteristics of this population were that they had frequent relapses, they had incomplete recovery following their relapses, and on their scans they had multiple gadolinium enhancing lesions, and uh, clinically they often involved the brain stem, the cerebellum, and the spine. So these were highly active patients, and um, they median age of this patient group was um, in their 20s, and they followed them up over um, 12 to 17 months and found uh, no evidence of disease activity in these patients. Uh, no, 12 months, 17 had no evidence of disease activity. Their average previous HSCT EDSS was 6.5, and of a follow-up period of about 29 and a half months, the follow-up EDSS was two. Now the range obviously on this EDSS score was zero to 6.5, but uh, the actual average EDSS improvement was 2.5 mm. score. So this obviously creates an argument for in those ones where you know you're going to get into trouble with future escalations. You need to be really mm. in there hard and fast. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, HSCT as first line? Well, I think this is, is obviously down to uh, 
you know, patient choice and, and neuro neurological risk aversion. And that, that was probably one of the kind of interesting sessions. There was a bit of an academic punch-up between um, one guy who was, you know, saying, yes, we should be early and aggressive, mm -hmm. and another guy saying, well, we should escalate. And again, that debate is ongoing. And in fact, the, the trial is kind of being planned. So um, I guess it's a watch this spacing. But when we talk about stem cells, I think what we've got to really emphasize mm -hmm. is that this is not about a stem cell that is going to turn into a brain cell. Uh, it's talking about a stem cell that is going to essentially replace your, um, your immune system. And that is because um, um, we do the you know, drugs yeah, so that deplete your immune system. Some of that is that there to actually pre prevent the infection that will, will, will come and could be So dangerous. they're bone marrow cells. Not, yeah, yeah. not actual neuronal. No, cells. so it's the ultimate immune replacement, and mm -hmm. you know, obviously, we've got good evidence that immune therapies work. The question is, is obviously, should we be using the ultra big guns at the beginning, or do we use it as a treatment of last resort? And obviously, I guess the question is, if you do use it very, very early, um, would it be, um, you know, all mm -hmm. we need? And that's what we would hope, um, but we'll have to see. Now, um, one of the interesting sessions which I didn't want to miss was inequity of DMTs across the world. Um, most of Europe, uh, often the prescribing is dictated by government officials or the payers or the providers. Mm -hmm. um, and in Latin America, there was also a high use of biosimilars. So there is inequality of uh, drugs being prescribed across the board. And given that we have viable clinical randomized controlled trials, why is there this inequity? I mean, it makes no sense. Mm. Um, well, OK, it makes complete sense then. But you know, the, these things, um, and one of the interesting points raised was the voice of the um, patient societies. Some mm -hmm. of the societies across Europe are government funded and therefore they have very little voice or power of weight to their voice, whereas if you take the UKMS society, it's more patient-funded in terms of things, and they have a larger voice. So there's lots of issues here about um, inequity of uh, provision of DMTs in the Western world, not even touching what happens in the third world countries um, where they have zero treatments. And that hasn't changed in the last decade or so either. Now, one of the things, one of the suggestions was that there is a WHO essential medicines list. And if MS drugs could be listed into that list, then uh, we may have some equity being established. And it may be a point where these list of drugs can be used for reimbursement. Yeah. Now, we all worry about not being paid back for these drugs. Mm -hmm. But um, if we can enter the MSDMTs into the WHO essential drug list, maybe that's a mm -hmm. way out. Well, I've got a bit of inside information. I know that the moves are underfoot with relation to that. So mm -hmm. again, I suppose it's watch that space. And uh, I can't tell you more, because that's kind of not what mm -hmm. I'm doing, really. But uh, yeah. So we have five minutes left, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I think in, on balance, um, the conference has been interesting. As you pointed out, David, there hasn't been a headlining mm. um, third phase three trial, mm. which would have been interesting to have. But I don't think we've missed anything. I mm. think we've been confirmed that the, uh, the drugs which we're using have high efficacy. It, we're in, entering into an interesting period where there'll be lots of similar drugs for the drugs we know of, which may be introduced into our practice with or without our consent, but they're here to stay. Mm -hmm. So that creates a lot of comp competition, and it may be more feasible to our healthcare providers. Um, so it would be interesting to see what's going to happen in the MS field over the next year and next 10 years, really. And there was one thing I just for you stem cell people. There was a, a stem cell <laughs> study looking at delivery into the, into the brain versus the, giving it blood. And I won't tell you too much, but what I will say is the European 
kind of study that was reported here has kind of replicated some of the studies that have been going on in New York. So um, going in the right direction, but we have to wait until the studies are properly done before I get too excited. So mm -hmm. on terms of the excitement, well, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, that's probably all we've got time for this, this year. And what we've got to do is then look forward to what happens uh, next, next year. year. So Ectrims 2019, we're going to Stockholm, David. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, so um, let's see what our new president mm. puts together in terms mm. of the program mm. and what Stockholm has to offer. Because I think um, even though there's been a kind of a lull, yeah. there is going to be a lot of studies reporting the following year. Yeah, so let's see. By in this time, in probably another hour or two, we'll actually know about some, you know, the, the hot, late breaking sessions and whether. Um, you know, MS Smart has been smart, and yes, and uh, well, I think that there's some other new treatments as well. Lots of treatments, mm. um, but I mean, what would you like Ectrims to talk about next year? What do you well, think? Well, obviously the the cure, but uh, <laughs> you know, that's uh, what you all want. I guess we all want it too. Yes, um, but you know, I think what we want is movement in progression. Um, we'd like obviously to see. Uh, where we are with you know repair studies, so we've got lots of science that's um, being presented here and elsewhere. Mm. So I think you know, if, yeah, there's more science. I mean, I, I I'm a scientist. I want to see more science, and that would be great. But um, you know, it's it's it, what will be presented is what is being do, doing. So um, I have to kind of take it up there, and we always have to sort mm -hmm. of thank the viewers. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you, yes. uh, all the uh, and people out there asking the questions. Some of them I wanted to hear and some of them probably didn't want to hear, but yes. you know, thank you for joining us. And uh, if Thanks. you're watching on YouTube, remember, you can just answer and ask a question uh, and we'll try and answer it. So uh, thank you for keeping us on our toes. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank the Ectrings Committee mm. for letting us do this um, five times in a row. Mm. Um, also, as a woman, I would like to plug women in science. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So um, more female woman. presenters, please, Professor Hemmer. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we'd obviously like to thank all the people that have helped us put on this. Um, yes. And just to say, you know, we had, you know, a first with the work we've been doing where we had an all-female uh, act. So let's yes. hope we can carry that Let's on. hope others can reproduce yeah. our efforts. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, everyone. I will see you next year. Well, hopefully. Me too, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I guess one thing is, if you say, if you say we're doing a good job, that may be encourage them to actually ask us back. Well, <laughs> and uh, please tweet. Yep. Keep tweeting. We, we want more Twitter. Yeah. Uh, Twitter comments about because it drives science forward and it, it makes everybody if you're one of the shy people it allows you to ask a question mm. without uh, standing at microphones so there was a lot of Twitter activity which I saw in Ectrims today which allowed lots of people to ask questions which they wouldn't have done if they weren't prominent so and so standing at the microphone. Oh and the other trial we'll, ha we'll have today is <laughs> It's a new drug that will target not only B cells but macrophages, and we really haven't gone there. Mm -hmm. And you can see from I've seen from the abstract, it's not all bad news. So um, yeah. that could be good. So I need to say "hejdo," which means "bye bye" in Swedish, and we hopefully will see you in Stockholm on Auf Wiedersehen. And goodbye, everybody. That mm -hmm. is the English roundup. Tschüss. <laughs>